My name is Susan Pond. I have the privilege of serving as President of the Royal Society of New South Wales and introducing distinguished laureate Professor John Aitken, Fellow of the Society, Chair of the Society's Hunter Branch and winner of the 2021 Clark Medal and Memorial Lecture. John already accepted his medal at Government House earlier this year. Now he will present the Clark Memorial Lecture on the important subject, the changing tide of human populations. Before introducing John, I will tell you about William Brown White Clark, Anglican Church clergyman and expert amateur geologist. Born in 1798 in East Suffolk in England, Clark arrived in New South Wales in 1839 to take up a chaplaincy at the age of 52. By that time, he already had a considerable cultural and scientific reputation and had been elected to the prestigious Geological Society of London. After his arrival, Clark served briefly in St. Peter's Parish in Campbelltown and as headmaster of the King's School in Parramatta. In August 1846, he moved to St. Thomas's Church in North Sydney, where he remained as its first rector until his retirement 25 years later. A stained glass window in that church memorialises his service. In addition to his ministry, Clark pursued wide-ranging geological fieldwork in Australia. He confirmed previous reports of gold deposits west of the Blue Mountains. He discovered diamonds, Silurian period rocks from more than 400 million years ago, and the age of coal-bearing rocks in New South Wales, including in the Hunter region. Clark also had a long-standing interest in zoology and paleontology. Among other things, he discovered fossils in Queensland of the extinct giant moa or flightless bird. His friendships in the colony including many people whose names would be familiar to you, Charles Nicholson, William Maclay and artist Conrad Martins. Clark played a very important role in the Royal Society of New South Wales. He was its longest serving vice president and delivered the vice presidential address to the society's first annual meeting under the title Royal in July 1867. At that time, the society's patron took the title of president, leaving the actual work of the society to the vice president. You will find Clark's 1867 address in the archives of the Society's Journal and Proceedings on our website. In his address, Clark was the first to openly make the claim that the Society is, and I quote, the oldest learned society in the Southern Hemisphere, tracing its origins to the Philosophical Society of Australasia, founded in 1821. He also presented his thoughts about the controversy of Darwin's theory of species evolution in the context of theology. After his death in 1878, the Society inaugurated the Clark Medal and Clark Memorial Lectures. Initially separate, they are now combined into one award. The Clark Medal made the society the first colonial society in Australia to reward scientific achievement in this way. The first medal was awarded in 1878 to Professor Richard Owen of the British Museum, famous for his studies of Australian vertebrate fossils. In 1879, it was awarded to George Bentham of the Royal Botanic Gardens in Kew, who made a major contribution to the study of Australian flora. And in 1880, it was awarded to Thomas Henry Huxley of the Royal Society of Mines in London for his valuable contributions to the knowledge of the natural history of Australia. The first Clark Memorial Lecture took a bit longer to organise. An appeal for subscriptions to this memorial fund had gone out to all the Australian colonies in July 1878, but the response was disappointing much less was subscribed than council had expected. 
even when the fund had built up by 1896, the society borrowed from it to meet the costs of repairs for its then premises in Elizabeth Street, Sydney. The first lecture was finally delivered in 1903 by geologist and Antarctic explorer Sir, Edward, Sir Edgeworth David. His topic, appropriately, was the life and work of Clark himself. Another Antarctic explorer, another Antarctic explorer, Sir Douglas Mawson, delivered the lecture in 1948. The combined Clark Medal and Lecture of Today is awarded each year for distinguished research in the natural sciences conducted in Australia and its territories. The fields of geology, botany and zoology are considered in rotation. The 2021 award is for zoology. This brings me to the Clark Memorial Lecture by Distinguished Laureate Professor John Aitken. The short version of John's bio linked to his name on the Society's website reads, John Aitken is a reproductive biologist widely known for identifying oxidative stress as a significant contribution to infertility and its actions on human sperm function. He has also made substantial contributions to clinical practice translation in male reproductive health notably the development of a new contraceptive vaccine. Relaying the long version of John's bio would consume all the remaining time we have for this introduction. But I must add that as well as being a fellow of the Royal Society of New South Wales since 2014, John is fellow of the Australian Academy of Science, the Australian Academy of Health and Medical Sciences, the Society for Reproductive Biology and the Royal Society of Edinburgh. John received a PhD and later a Doctor of Science degree from the University of Cambridge, the latter being awarded in 1998, the same year that he moved to Australia to take up the appointment of Chair of Biological Sciences at the University of Newcastle. Since then, John has served in several senior leadership roles at the university while also continuing his research in reproductive biology, for which he has received numerous prestigious international and national awards. John's current position is Scientific Director of Memphis Limited, a company that is developing a range of assisted reproduction products, for many of which John's research has been critical. John, I trust that you are especially proud to receive the Society's Clark Medal and deliver the Clark Memorial Lecture in honour of a key figure in the life of the Royal Society of New South Wales. So to begin with, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which uh, we meet and uh, pay respects to elders past, uh, present and emerging. I'd also like to, uh, in the beginning, thank the Royal Society of New South Wales for the, uh, the honour and the privilege of being able to deliver um, the Clark Memorial Lecture. And in particular, to thank the President of the Royal Society of New South Wales, uh, Professor Susan Pond, for her kind introduction. The lecture I'm about to give really addresses the long-term fate of the human population. The rapid expansion of humankind since the first industrial revolution has raised understandable concerns about overpopulation, the evidence of which is before us every minute of every day in the form of pollution and pandemics and global climate change. But somewhat counterintuitively, I believe we are poised on the precipice that we'll see a rapid reversal in population numbers in the coming decades. And very much what happens to our species in the future may well depend on the speed and the depth of our response to the perfect storm of powerful social, environmental and evolutionary factors that are placing downward pressure on population numbers. The tide of human dominion over the earth may be about to turn. And uh, this lecture, I hope, uh, will explain why. Well, again, thank you very much much to the uh, Royal Society of New South Wales for the opportunity to give the Clark Memorial Lecture 
on the changing tide of uh, human fertility. In many ways, uh, my journey to this particular lecture has been more than half a century in the making. It began um, more than half a century ago uh, when I left uh, the seaside town of Barnstable in North Devon, where I'd grown up, and moved to the bright lights of London in 1966, ostensibly to uh, join a rock and roll band and set my soul free. There then followed uh, three years of intense soul freeing activity, at the end of which uh, I had to acknowledge that probably I did not have a career as a professional musician, but somehow and rather inadvertently, I'd managed to pick up a degree in zoology from the University of London and now possessed a rather unnecessarily detailed knowledge of the evolution of the reptilian skull, which was our uh, professor's favorite topic. Unfortunately, um, job opportunities for failed musicians who know a lot about uh, reptilian evolution are few and far between. And for a while I was a bit lost as to what uh, I would do next, but then very happily, I was rescued uh, by this man, uh, Roger Valentine Short. At the time, he was a senior lecturer at the University of Cambridge and ran a group uh, specializing in reproductive science. And he invited me to join his research group to do uh, a PhD on the, studying the way in which the endometrium, the lining of the womb, uh, manages to control the very early stages of uh, embryonic growth. This was a wonderful opportunity for me and I grasped it with both hands because at the time, both Roger and myself were very concerned about this graph, which essentially shows the rise and rise of humankind. It took uh, from the dawn of time until 1804 to grow a world population of about 1 billion souls. We paused very briefly for the Black Death uh, but then once we'd uh, learned how to unleash the energy bound up in fossil fuels and learned how to control infant and childhood mortality through better primary health care, once we'd got those lessons under our belt, there was really no stopping us. And our population numbers shut up past five, six, seven, eight billion. We're heading for 10 billion you know, or more in the coming decade. This uh, concerned us greatly and our concern was exacerbated uh, by the publication of this book uh, by Paul Ehrlich, uh, The Population Bomb. It sold over two million copies and it really had a major impact on public opinion about human, human population. And in this book, he essentially uh, posits that um, population growth, along with uh, overconsumption per capita, was going to drive civilization to an existential edge. Uh, in essence, he was saying that uh, we were our numbers were growing so fast that we were essentially going to uh, starve to death. And indeed, he predicted that by the year 2000, uh, the United Kingdom would be uh, just a small group of impoverished islands inhabited by some 70 million hungry people. Well, he got the population number approximately right but the status of that population he got wrong. And he should have known he was wrong if he'd actually looked at the data at the time he was writing his book. On the left-hand side here, uh, we see a plot of the rate of po human population growth. And it was extremely rapid in the 1960s, uh, but then suddenly plateaued in about 1963. And by the time he wrote his book in 1968, was really uh, very stable and on the edge of an inexorable decline that will take it down towards and below zero. This sudden stabilization and subsequent decline of uh, the rate of population growth was dependent on a sudden decline in human fertility rates, which began in about 1963. And just to <clears throat> define terms at the beginning of this lecture, Fertility rate uh, refers to the number of children each woman will have in her reproductive lifespan. So historically, women would have six or seven children, and by uh, this current time, we're close to something called replacement rate, which is essentially the number of children each woman would have to have for the population to remain constant. And uh, that replacement rate, the consensus for that replacement rate is 2.1 children, one child to replace the mother, one child to replace the father. 
and uh, point one to account for infant and childhood uh, mortality. So that was uh, the reason why the rate of population growth was declining. And the really key question is what happens next? Uh, does the population stabilize? This has been suggested by the United Nations that the uh, population of the world will stabilize at or around uh, replacement rates. And if that's true, that's incre incredibly comforting. And uh, we can all uh, go home, curl up in front of a log fire and have a nice cup of tea and a hobnob because there's really nothing wrong with what's going to happen to the world's population. It's just going to stabilize at a new, slightly lower rate. However, uh, I believe that the forces that are driving this downward trend in fertility rates are so powerful, pernicious and prevalent that there is no reason why they should stop. And I believe that they will go below replacement levels and uh, will um, have a major impact on population numbers in the future. And really what I want to do in this lecture is present to you the evidence that this uh, decline in human fertility rates is going to continue so that we are well below replacement rates in the future. Before I do that, I just want to spend one slide um, discussing um, demography with you, and in particular, an important demographic principle, which is the demographic transition. When we were starting uh, life on Earth some 200,000 years ago or more, Paleolithic men and women led lives that were nasty, brutish, and short. There was a high birth rate, but it was matched by an equally high death rate, and population numbers were low and stable. And that's how it's been for our species for over 200,000 years. But then, at the... Uh, beginning of the 19th century, the end of the 18th century, uh, Arkwright and Hargreaves initiated the first of a series of industrial and technological revolutions. And essentially what has happened since that time is that there has been a wave of social economic development, which has swept across the earth, culminating in the kind of uh, modern industrialized society that we now associate with the 21st century. Interestingly, when populations go through this, uh, uh, the changes associated with socioeconomic development, their population dynamics change in a very predictable way. And uh, demographers have isolated uh, or identified five stages of the demographic transition. In the beginning, uh, birth rates increase slightly because of the uh, increased uh, uh, resources available and death rates uh, decline, particularly infant and childhood death rates. Because of this gap between birth rates and death rates, the population naturally increases and then stabilizes at around stage four or five of the demographic transition. The astute amongst you will notice that uh, the population seems to keep on continuing even though birth rates are declining. And that's because of something called population momentum. And essentially what it means is that the young girls that are born here uh, will turn into young women 20 years later and enter reproductive age. And the population will continue to rise as they have children of their own. So all populations when they're in growth phase have a certain momentum built into them. And indeed the, the world population is poised around about here now where the numbers are beginning to stabilize uh, but birth rates are extremely low, as are death rates. And the really interesting question is what happens next? Uh, the world does not stabilize that uh, demographic transition stage five. Something's going to, these trends will continue into the future. And then we need to know what's going to happen. Will, as the World Health Organization suggests, um, will the population stabilize? Or will it uh, show a very rapid descent that only the lost souls of dinosaurs and dodos will really understand. So I want to look into that. What is this going to happen to our population in the future? Well, we've got a pretty good idea if we just look at fertility rates across the world. And I've selected here the tiger economies of Southeast Asia, Taiwan, South Korea, Singapore. I could show any one of those uh, um, societies, uh, including Japan and so on. And you always get the same shape graph. In other words, there was a brief uh, increase in fertility rates in the late 50 or early 50s after the Second World War. And then that was precipitated by a massive decline 
in fertility, in fertility rates. And those fertility rates did not, as the UN suggests, stabilize at around replacement level, but just kept on going downwards. And we now think that uh, in the coming decades, uh, 183 of 195 countries in the world will have sub-replacement level fertility rates. So this is quite a, a dramatic change in fertility rates in, uh, in humankind. And uh, we need to understand what's causing it. Uh, this is a portrait of uh, Thomas Malthus. He was born in 1766 and died in 1834, which is actually the same year that this uh, portrait was painted. And he died in the West Country city of Bath in Somerset, uh, which actually was the same city I was born in, not the same year, but the same location. And when he was only 32 years old, he wrote an essay, an essay on the principle of population, uh, which uh, really changed the face of demography. And in it, he postulated the following. Uh, population numbers tend to increase uh, geometrically. They have an exponential rate of increase, whereas the resources needed to support those populations increase arithmetically. They are linear. So once you get beyond a certain point of crisis, as he called it, uh, the gap between population numbers and food supply widens. And in the end, all growing populations are destined to starve. Uh, because uh, they will outstrip the food supplies needed to support them. So one possibility is that decline in fertility rates that we've seen in humankind is a, a kind of Malthusian crisis. We're just going to run out of food. Uh, well, in fact, that's not the case. Uh, as population rates or fertility rates have declined, uh, we've seen uh, both an increase in crop production and livestock production. So as the fertility rates decline towards replacement levels around two, food production is actually increased. We have more crop production now in those societies with very low fertility levels. We have more livestock production in societies with very low fertility levels. So I think we can discount a uh, Malthusian cause for our lack of fertility. In many ways, I'm reminded of E.O. Wilson's comments about communism, a uh, great idea, just the wrong species. So if it's not uh, that we're starving to death, what is it? Well, it's something to do with prosperity. No matter what country in the world you select, if you plot uh, GDP against fertility rates, you get this uh, very characteristic draft. Whereas GDP increases, so fertility rates come down dramatically. And, and, and as I've seen said before, they don't stop at replacement levels, they just keep on going. I've kind of randomly shown here Brazil, Taiwan, and South Korea, but any number of countries will show exactly the same relationships. And you don't need a very much increase in prosperity for fertility rates to decline dramatically. Less than uh, half a trillion dollars in South Korea was enough to decimate their population growth. And one of the most fascinating countries in this context is of course China. And I could uh, devote a whole lecture to China. We all know that the Chinese economy has increased dramatically uh, since the uh, early 60s. Uh, and is now, it, China is now one of the major economies in the world. As the economy was improving, so for all the reasons I've given, uh, fertility rates declined and they are now well below uh, replacement levels. Um, when I say China, people immediately think of the one child uh, family policy. That was introduced in 1980 and it had absolutely no effect at all. Uh, the population fertility rates had already started to decline uh, when that policy was introduced. And when it was introduced, the Chinese population actually increased their fertility slightly. It didn't have uh, the effect that was looked for, but then it continued its inexorable decline. And the Chinese government panicked and uh, in 2015 produced the two child family policy and last year introduced the three child family policy. The fact is that the factors that are driving this decline in fertility rate are so powerful, they just don't respond to political edicts. And if we plot a fertility rate against a GDP, as I've done here, you can see that it didn't take very much prosperity, uh, just $2.1 trillion, which is way down here in the terms of economic growth, was enough to decimate uh, fertility rates in China. It had nothing to do with one child or two child family policies. 
but it had everything to do with a small increase in prosperity. Uh, we see uh, very interesting and similar changes in uh, Australia. So Australia has also seen a wonderful increase in prosperity uh, over the last uh, half century. And over that period of time, exactly the same period of time, we have seen uh, predictably fertility rates decline. And if we plot fertility rate against GDP, you get this characteristic graph. And again, we are now well below a replacement level. It may be a surprise, therefore, if we look at the human, the Australian population, that it's actually increased in parallel with the, the economy. These two things have gone hand in hand. So how is the population increased at the same time as fertility rates have fallen through the floor? And the answer, the obvious answer, is that we have uh, pulled the trigger of migration. Like many, many industrialized nations, we are now entirely reliant on uh, um, immigration in order to uh, paste over our um, decline in intrinsic fertility rates. Um, the peak was in 2009 when we gave immigration visas to over 300,000 people. But immigration is a very unstable way of um, looking after your population. Uh, last year, we saw uh, actually the Australian population went into reverse because we saw the lowest net migration levels since uh, World War I. And uh, this year, too, uh, population has gone backwards uh, because immigration is a bit like natural gas. You know, it's a, it's a way of covering over the cracks and some fundamental problems, but it is not the solution to the problem. And one of the reasons it's not the solution to the problem is that the problem itself is global. It's not just Australia that suffers uh, low levels of fertility. Those traditional wellsprings of humanity, like China, as I've already mentioned, and like India, uh, have suffered their own decline in fertility rates. And uh, India is now poised on the edge of replacement level, and there's going to be nothing to stop it continuing below rep replacement levels in the future. So these countries that we've turned to in order for their talented uh, uh, immigrants to bolster our population numbers and drive our economy, that's going to be a well to which we can't keep returning because they are going to suffer their own fertility crisis in the future. So what about Africa? Africa has very high fertility rates, and that's definitely true. They do have high fertility rates. Uh, uh, but if I plot for sub-Saharan African countries uh, fertility rates over time, you can see that in all these countries, although fertility rates are still high, around about four children per woman, the trend is inexorably downwards, and they too uh, will ultimately suffer their own fertility crisis. So we have to be careful about using uh, migration as a way of trying to balance uh, our population numbers. So what are the major causes then? It's something to do with affluence that's driving uh, this decline in fertility rates across the world. And there are three essential factors which are involved, and I'll consider each one in turn. The first one I want to talk about is social educational factors. Uh, the second ones will be, uh, one will be environmental lifestyle factors, and the third one will be evolutionary factors. The short-term factors that are driving down human fertility rates are definitely uh, socio-economic, socio-educational. These are the more or less the graphs that I've shown you before. In recent time, GD, world GDP has increased. The socioeconomic evolution keeps on going. Uh, as we become more um, affluent, so infant mortality rates come down, so childhood mortality rates come down. And because uh, these two numbers are coming down, there's no reason anymore to have large families, and so total fertility rate comes down. And as total fertility rates comes down, comes down, there is a um, an advantage, maybe an unintended advantage, but certainly a major advantage to women, because they are given one of life's most precious resources, which is time. Uh, they no longer have to look at uh, look after seven or eight children. They now, in most advanced industrial countries, only have to look after two or three children, or even less. So they now have time, and the way they invest their time is in education. It's been uh, a slow and grinding process, I know, and it hasn't gone as fast as we would like it to do. But uh, gradually, we're getting towards parity with 50% uh, of the children being educated, uh, being being male and 50% being female. We're at just over 48% currently globally. 
An interesting thing happens though, as women become educated and that it has immediate effect on their fertility rate. And you see that dramatically in the case of tertiary education shown here. Uh, you only need 10% of your female population entering tertiary education and fertility rates uh, really drop like a stone. So uh, what's happening here? Why would uh, female education uh, precipitate a sudden fall in fertility rates? Well, I think we are locked into a very um, um, virtuous self-perpetuating cycle. When we have increased prosperity, that as I've already described, has a major impact on infant and childhood mortality and societies go through the demographic transition leading to a lower fertility rate. This gives women um, uh, the opportunity to become educated and more women enter the workforce. And we know that the more women enter the workforce, the more prosperity you see in society. And that further drives down the, the um, childhood and infant mortality rates and hence fertility. So this is a, a virtuous cycle up to a point. If this big wheel keeps on turning, it's going to have a major impact on population numbers. So the challenge that's somehow before us is that we have to encourage the left-hand side of this equation. We would like more and more women to enter the workforce. It's going to be very important for our prosperity in the future because we're all becoming aged societies with a diminishing number of young people entering the workforce and generating the revenues necessary to support our aging population. To balance that, we need more and more women in the workforce. But what we have to prevent is the entry of women into the workforce having this uh, dramatic effect on total uh, fertility rates. And the solution to this problem is uh, uh, at least partly to provide young people with the resources they need to have children earlier in life. Um, and in many ways, Scandinavia, Scandinavia leads the way with its uh, very uh, generous parental leave schemes that encourage people to uh, both enter the workforce, but also have children earlier. The other point I want to draw out from this graph is that to some extent, uh, we are in denial of our fundamental biology. And this is going to be more and more important in the future. We are um, just about the only species on earth uh, that uh, stops reproducing in midlife. Uh, most species, be, be it your laboratory rat or your feral wallaby, are going to uh, keep on reproducing to the day they die, but not us. Uh, we stop reproducing in midlife. And here I show the reproductive life's history of women from two different societies. On the bottom here is a woman from the Kung Hunter-Gatherer Society of the Kalahari Desert. And they, in many ways, live a reproductive life as nature intended. Um, Menarche occurs quite late in life because of the low plane of nutrition. Very soon after Menarche, they will get married. There will be a brief period of adolescent fertility where menstruation is occurring, but ovulation is not occurring, so the woman cannot conceive. But then she will have her first child when she's 19.5 years of age. Uh, life from that moment on is a, a reproductive life, is an alternating sequence of pregnancy and lactation and amenorrhea. And what that means is that uh, as long as the baby is suckling at breast, the brain will ensure that uh, further ovulations will not occur. So this uh, stops any further pregnancies while the mother is lactating. It is, if you like, uh, nature's contraceptive, and it has a very important birth spacing effect for women in these societies. Uh, because of lactation and menorrhea, by the age of 35, the average hunter-gatherer woman would have had uh, five children, and then she will stop reproducing and enter the post-reproductive phase of life. Contrast that with someone in our own society, let's say in Sydney, uh, where there is a, a relatively early menarche uh, because of the high plane of nutrition, and then women in our society um, experience a long period of cultural infertility maintained by contraception. And they don't think about having children until they um, are in their late 20s, early 30s. The average age for an Australian woman to have her first child is about the age of 30. And then there's just time to squeeze in 1.7 children before the portcullis of age-related infertility comes down. So we are trying to squeeze our reproductive life into the tail end 
of what nature intended to be our reproductive lifespan. And in many ways, we are in denial of our fundamental biology. This graph just plots uh, human fertility over the lifespan of a reproductive lifespan of a woman. Uh, women are at their most fertile when they're about 19, 20 years of age, which is uh, exactly when uh, the hunter-gatherer woman is having her first child. It's then relatively stable until the age of about uh, 35, uh, which is when the hunter-gatherer stops having uh, children. And then fertility declines uh, quite dramatically and suddenly until all fertility is lost just over the age of uh, 40 years of age. And this tragedy for women in our society is that they are trying to have their children at about this time of life when uh, natural fertility is declining rapidly. I give public lectures on this and uh, I meet many women who say it's okay. I can devote myself to my, to my career and uh, put off childbearing until my early thirties because whatever else happens, I can turn to IVF to help me. Well, sadly, uh, uh, IVF has many wonderful things associated with it, but it cannot rescue age-related infertility. I won't go into the details of IVF, but it was a technology pioneered by Patrick Steptoe and Bob Edwards, for which Bob Edwards won the Nobel Prize in 2010. And it has brought uh, much joy and happiness to millions of couples. And uh, I was around when this was uh, being developed and was much, very much a part of the development of this technology. Um, but the one thing this wonderful technology cannot do is rescue uh, women from age-dependent infertility. And indeed, if we look at live birth rates following um, IVF, uh, we see exactly the same inflection point around the age of 35, and then a sudden reduction in live birth rates until they are practically zero at around the age of 41, uh, 42. So IVF cannot help you. And of course it cannot help you because all IVF ever does is to juxtaposition the male and the female gamete. It's a perfectly uh, reasonable form of therapy for women with block fallopian tubes, which was the reason why it was developed in the first instance. In post-war Britain, block fallopian tubes was a very uh, powerful cause of human infertility. In that case, the sperm just can't get to the egg. So if we put those two gametes together in a test tube and allow fertilization to take place in vitro, we overcome the problem. But for age-related infertility, that's not the problem. It's not that the uh, eggs of the aging woman cannot be found by the sperm of the husband. Uh, it's that the eggs of the aging woman have lost the potential, that miraculous potential to develop into a new individual. So it's this loss of developmental potential in the eggs after sitting for 35 years in the patient's ovaries, that loss of developmental potential which is the reason for the infertility. And that cannot be rescued by putting the egg next to a sperm cell. And it's kind of a modern day tragedy. But if we look at numbers in Australia, uh, there are uh, about 20,000 women over the age of 40 who are in current uh, therapy in IVF centers in Australia. And on a per cycle basis, they stand less than a 5% chance of having a child of their between 40 and 44 and uh, less than a 1% chance if they are over the age of 45. So 95% uh, of the time, when women go over the age of 40, go through an IVF cycle, they will leave with their bank balances lightened, but their procreational aspirations unfulfilled. So I've talked a lot about the female side of the equation. Now I want to talk to the male side of the uh, reproductive equation and now focus on environmental and lifestyle factors and the impact they may have on human fertility. So these are uh, human spermatozoa on the left, and this is a micrograph of the average uh, human ejaculate. Uh, the human ejaculate is a notoriously horrible thing. Uh, we have one of the lowest fertility rates uh, in, uh, in biology. Um, the average uh, fertility rate for our species is only about 25%. That is the chance that you will conceive following intercourse at just the right time of the cycle is only one in four. 
whereas for um, most wild animals, it's close to 100%. And one of the reasons for that is the poor state of uh, human male fertility. Uh, my old professor in Cambridge used to say that if men were bulls, we'd all be taken into the back backyard and shot. Because when you look at a micrograph of a human ejaculate, actually very difficult to find a normal looking sperm cell in that picture. So we have very poor semen quality. And there is uh, evidence now that semen quality is getting poorer with the passage of time. This was uh, an alarm that was raised in actually the early 90s, 1992. Carlson et al. published a paper in the British Medical Journal suggesting that when they looked at papers uh, uh, reporting human sperm counts, they noticed that the sperm counts were getting lower with the passage of time. Uh, this was a very controversial claim and the data had been worked through a thousand times with a number of different statistical procedures. But now uh, quite large databases have uh, been released and analyzed, uh, which show that actually this is true and it's true across the globe. It's not just uh, the Western population, but the Chinese population uh, as well is showing a decline in sperm counts with the passage of time. I won't go into these studies in detail, but let me just capture for you the essence of it. In about 1970, the average human sperm count was about 100 million per milliliter. Uh, 50 years later, it was half, about 47 million per milliliter. And both of these uh, studies are showing exactly the same thing. That is a rapid secular decline in human sperm numbers. Too fast, much too fast to be genetic, um, much too widespread to be genetic. It certainly has to be environmentally induced, but what are the environmental factors involved is the key issue. We have to be careful when we talk about sperm counts because people immediately equate it with uh, fertility. And of course uh, you can have, you only need one sperm to fertilize an egg. So having a few, fewer, sp a few fewer sperm may not be uh, a cause of infertility. However, my uh, good colleague, uh, Shanna Swan, has just uh, actually published a book called Countdown, in which she points out that the forces that are driving down human sperm counts are inexorable and um, perpetual. They, they're, they're show no signs of, of, of stopping. And there will come a time when the sperm counts decline that you will get close to zero, and then it will have an impact on human fertility. And indeed, uh, you can take um, data from national populations. I've selected here the French population, which has uh, exhibits sperm counts that are declining by about 2.1% per annum. And if you extrapolate that line uh, forward, the French nation stops reproducing in 2030 or thereabouts. We could do the same thing for New Zealand. Look at their data and extrapolate their data forward and they stop reproducing in 2026. Well, at this point, uh, there may be some rugby fans in England and Australia that are rubbing their hands with glee, uh, but really there's a serious point here. And uh, it's Shanna's point, which is that the environmental factors um, that are driving down human sperm counts seem to be, whatever they are, seem to be unrelenting. And there will come a time when we suppress sperm counts to, so that they are so low that it will have an impact on human fertility. And we have to be aware of that. And this, of course, uh, raises uh, key questions about what the mechanism is. And in truth, we don't know what the mechanism is, but uh, in this lecture, I shall make uh, a proposal to you for which at least there is some evidence to support. As sperm counts have been declining, there is now emerging data suggesting that testosterone levels have been declining in parallel. On the left-hand side, we see data from the United States and it clearly shows this is plotting testosterone levels with men, male age. And there is always a bit of a decline with male age, but nevertheless, the range of testosterone levels was much higher in 1987 to 1989 than it was 2002 to 2004. And on the right-hand side, uh, we have uh, now Israeli data, um, which really picks up the story in 2006 and 2009, testosterone levels were significantly higher than they were in 2016 to 19. So there is some evidence that in parallel with the decline in sperm counts, we are seeing a decline in testosterone levels. So what uh, could possibly be driving that? 
Well, one uh, possibility is that this is related to an estrogenic attack. Estrogen is known as a hormone, is known to drive down testosterone levels and test low testosterone levels will have an impact on sperm number. Where does this estrogen come from? Well, it's coming from many different sources in modern industrialized societies. It's coming from our own internal metabolism. We live in a world where there is a pandemic of obesity and people who are overweight. And as people become overweight and obese, they start to generate, uh, men that is, they start to generate more estradiol in their system and that will suppress uh, testosterone levels. We are reproducing at older and older ages and that too as we age, that increases estrogen levels in the blood and that will depress uh, testosterone levels. We live in a world which is uh, quite heavily polluted and uh, there are pollutants in the environment uh, with estrogenic-like activity, the ones that have been studied uh, most extensively are bisphenol A and phthalate esters. And those uh, uh, pollutants are in the plastics that we use to ho house our food and the water that we drink, and they too, uh, will suppress uh, testosterone production and sperm counts. And finally, estrogen is a major component of the food we eat. This is particularly true of the meat industry and the dairy industry, but also true of many of the um, vegetables that we eat, fruit and vegetables we eat, contain estrogen. So all of these things added together may uh, amount to a bit of an estrogenic attack on uh, human reproduction. And in the male, this leads to a decrease in testosterone production and a suppression of sperm counts. Now, sperm counts, as I've already iterated, are a very um, uh, arcane and inherently inaccurate way of measuring uh, human reproductive function. And if all I had to go on was sperm counts, uh, I don't think you'd be very impressed. But there is something else which is happening at the same time to the human male, which in a way is uh, even more powerful than the decline in sperm counts. I was asked by a journalist recently uh, whether in preparing this lecture and a book that's uh, related to this lecture, which I shall refer to later, uh, whether I had uh, suddenly across, come across any data which significantly alarmed me. And I said, yes, actually, there was one graph that terrified me, and uh, this is that graph. So what I've done here is to plot total fertility rate left to right. So this is as fertility rate is declining towards uh, zero. And as I already said, most industrial societies are now somewhere around about two. Uh, we see an exponential increase in uh, testicular cancer rates. And each dot here is a different country. So as nations go through the demographic transition and uh, their fertility rates fall to below at or below replacement level, so you see this dramatic increase in testicular cancer rates. Uh, this is a global phenomenon and it relates to our own populations. Uh, I just uh, dug up the data from the New South Wales Cancer Registry. And uh, indeed in New South Wales, testicular cancer rates are increasing and indeed uh, increasing faster in New South Wales than they are in most other parts of the world. This is uh, not true of other reproductive cancers like ovarian cancer, which is quite stable, and cervical cancer, which is coming down because of uh, the excellent screening procedures that we now have for that particular disease. So testicular cancer seems to be um, rising in modern industrialized societies, but it's not the only cancer which characterizes modern industrial society. In addition to an increase in testicular cancer rate in New South Wales, we're also seeing uterine cancers increasing. And of course, as all over the world, we are seeing breast cancers increasing. And if you ask me, well, what could possibly connect uh, testicular cancer, uterine cancer, and breast cancer, uh, the one thing I would suggest is again, estrogen-like compounds. So I think we can make a plausible argument that the rise in modern day patterns of uh, cancer and uh, the reduction in sperm counts could have a common cause in uh, increased exposure to metabolic and environmental estrogens. And that's certainly something which uh, is being heavily researched at the present time and will be important to take forward into the future. 
And they're the third, the third group of factors which are driving down human fertility rates. These are much longer acting factors, uh, but in the end, they may prove to be the most powerful. Uh, I've already discussed with you the demographic transition. So as societies go from um, one with high infant mortality, where we have very large families, as they go through this demographic transition with improved socioeconomic status, so family sizes decline until you get to Australia, uh, where you have only 1.7 children. In Victorian London, uh, the average family size was uh, 11. 11, imagine that, that's the average family size. Why would Victorian women decide that uh, it's important to have um, 11 children? Well, as I said before, in relation to uh, Paleolithic uh, culture, um, life in Victorian London was nasty, uh, brutish and short. And uh, many of those children were going to die before they got to sexual maturity, met a partner and uh, were able to have children of their own and thereby pass your genes on into the next generation. So under those conditions, there is heavy selection pressure on human fertility. You have to be capable of having 11 children for enough to survive and pass your genes on into the next generation and uh, for you to participate actively in the procreative process. If you then fast forward to modern industrialized society, we may only be capable of having 1.7 children, but we can guarantee that those children are going to survive. And under these circumstances, there's really no selection pressure on fertility. So we know from work in domestic animals, if you do not select for something, uh, then you are going to use it, lose it. So in some senses, uh, a loss of human fertility is inevitable with the passage of time due to a lack of selection pressure. But we're going to exacerbate that with uh, our uptake of IVF therapy. It's hard to know with certainty, but roughly 50% or so of uh, all human fertility, it has a genetic cause. And uh, the problem with genetic causes of infertility is that when we use IVF to uh, address them, we pass those poor fertility genes on into the next generation. And this didn't really matter when IVF was a co cottage industry and responsible for less than 1% of births worldwide. But all over the world, the uptake of in vitro fertilization therapy is exponentially upwards. We are seeing more and more women uh, take recourse to IVF in order to have their children. In Denmark now, 10% of all new births are accounted for by assisted uh, reproductive technology. In Australia, it's nearly 7% of all uh, new births involve uh, assisted reproductive technology. And uh, the trend is inexorably upwards. And the more we use uh, ART in one generation, clearly the more we're going to need it in the next because we're just uh, making sure those poor fertility genes are passed on into the next generation. So when IVF is practiced at scale, it will contribute to the continuing decline of human fertility, uh, the decline of which is, in that sense, inevitable. So if we wrap all this up, you know, right now, I think there is a range, there, there's a range of social, economic, chemical and biological factors that are serving to drive down human fertility at unprecedented rates. The net consequence of this is that when um, population momentum is used up, the population will decline and it will decline much faster than anticipated. Having a smaller population may be uh, good news to many, and uh, including myself, I would love to see a smaller population, but we run a risk of falling into an infertility trap from which it may very be very difficult to escape. I know that this, uh, this message is going to be very difficult to get across for a number of reasons. First of all, as I said in my introduction to this talk, uh, we are constantly surrounded by evidence of overpopulation, whether it's uh, the COVID pandemic or pollution or the various manifestations of climate change. Uh, we see around us the evidence of uh, overpopulation, not underpopulation. And secondly, uh, the underpopulation phenomenon, the population decline that I've described, is uh, something that doesn't fit neatly into a three to five year political cycle. It's going to be decades in the making and a bit like climate change, 
by the time we realize that something is happening to us, it may be uh, too late to effect a change. So really the key now is to start to wake up to the fact that this is going to happen. We're poised at a point where the world's population is going to start to decline and we somehow have to manage that decline so it doesn't have catastrophic consequences. And there are a number of things that we could do. Uh, and very briefly, we can engineer social change to support young families to have children earlier so that women are not trying to reproduce when their reproductive life is coming to an end. We could um, be much more uh, intensive in our screening of reproductive toxicants in the environment. We could gain a much deeper cause, the understanding of the causes of human infertility and not constantly be using IVF as a default infertility treatment. Let's try to get to the grips, to grips with the causes of human infertility and address them at their source, not just use IVF as a panacea treatment for all infertility. We need to completely revise sex education and give people a much more realistic view of how fragile uh, fertility actually is and uh, how you have to take care of that aspect of your life. And uh, finally, we have to improve socio-political awareness of the change that is about to come. There's a lot there in those statements and I haven't had time to give them justice. Happily, I've summarized most of the arguments in a book uh, which has just been published by Cambridge University Press and it's called The Infertility Trap. And in it, I summarize the arguments that are uh, there to support a uh, pending decline of the human population and the things that we have to do now in order to stop this uh, happening in an uncontrolled manner. Finally, I would just like to uh, uh, thank a number of people who've made this talk possible. Uh, my own research group, the Priority Research Center of Reproductive Science at the University of Newcastle, we really started with uh, nothing 25 years ago. And now uh, we have one of the largest uh, reproductive science groups in the world and a wonderful new generation of young scientists who are going to carry our work forward into the future. I'd like to thank the University of Newcastle for their constant support over uh, uh, the last 25 years. It's been an absolute pleasure to work in this environment. Um, the Royal Society of New South Wales for the opportunity to uh, give this talk. And finally, I'd like to thank my family for all the support they've given me over a very long period of time. Thank you. Well, look, uh, I hope you enjoyed the lecture. Uh, the message I'm trying to convey is certainly counterintuitive in a world exhibiting all the signs of overpopulation. Nevertheless, a change is about to come and uh, we are at the beginning of what I believe will be quite a sudden decline in human population numbers. And this will be a welcome change to many uh, who feel that uh, a reduction in the size of the human population uh, would be welcome and I can only agree with that. However, a sudden decline in population numbers in a world which is dominated by the quest for continuous economic growth could be extremely damaging. So now would really be a good moment to reflect on the changes that are occurring before our eyes and take remedial steps uh, set out at the end of the lecture in order to uh, evolve, avoid a rapid descent into an infertility trap. Um, thank you very much for your attention. John, on behalf of the Society and the University of Newcastle, I thank you for delivering such a wonderful thought-provoking lecture. Thought-provoking because of your prediction of a massive collapse in fertility, or as you put it in the title of your book, The Infertility Trap. You presented the evidence clearly and with clear-sighted vision. Your call to arms was gentle, but nonetheless, insistent. You rightly join an illustrious lineage of recipients of the Society's Clark Medal and Memorial Lecture. Thank you so much for your presentation.